I call this talk self understanding of self organization. It's a bit bizarre of a title, but you will see hopefully at the end what I mean by that. And uh, I'm going to take you to a place where most of you have not been. In fact, I'm sure that none of you has been. I'm going to show you pictures that I know you haven't seen because some of it hasn't even been published. Most of the things I'm going to show you is going to appear in the next edition of Nature. So those of you who are more interested about the details can always go and look at that work, perhaps with more technical aspect to it. Um, so let's start by asking what is self-organization? What do I mean by self-understanding of self-organization? Self-organization surrounds us all over the world, everywhere we look at. In a non-living system, you might want to consider the formation of a snowflake as a great example of self-organization. All of you guys know that snowflakes are made of individual water molecules, H2O, where without any requirement for extrinsic factors or influence, get together and make these amazing radially symmetrical patterns where every snowflake is different than the other one. And this happens with zero force and zero energy from the outside world. It's a spontaneous phenomena that we call self-organization. This is in the infinitely small space. In the infinitely big world, you can imagine the formation of the planets, the stars, the planets turning around the stars, the moon turning around the planet, all self-organized from a starting point that we call Big Bang. So non-living system, large systems, small systems, self-organized. But of course, living systems self-organized as well. And uh, here's an example of a movie that, that uh, my two sons made when they came for a visit in the lab a few years ago. And to me, this is one of the most amazing illustration of self-organization. You're looking at the eggs of a frog way before it became a tadpole. And I've lined them up here, or they have lined them up here, 10 of them, sitting in what is pond water, so zero influence coming from the outside. And each one of these spheres, as you can see it, will go ahead and develop and give rise to a tadpole that somehow can freely interact with his environment, exchange information, evade predators, and look for food. So it's almost becoming an obsession for me. Everywhere I look, I look for self-organization. You guys are self-organized here. You decided that you're going to come and take a seat, and you decided without any other influence other than your own choice or who you're hanging with to give a given position in that, in that auditorium. So what about us? What about our origin, the way we are formed as human beings? Is there self-organization somewhere to be found? Is it that we need extra forces or independent energy to create who we are? Or can it all be programmed in a matter of self-organization? And this is the question I'm going to take you through today. And I'm going to tell you about your own origins. I'm going to be like a mirror that reflects your past, way, way, way past, the early, early events. So all of you here start like this. You start as a fertilized egg all the way on the left of the screen. And within a month or so, 35, this is what you look like before you're all sitting here so beautifully listening to me. You all go through this. And you notice that this doesn't really look like any of us here. Maybe this last one is getting close. You can recognize the head. But what is this tail doing there? We all have tails. You can see the, the bronchial arches. We're like fish. We have gills underneath our head and, and the neck area. So are we starting as fish, frogs? What is the tail about? Where is this coming from? And this kind of question has interested me and my colleagues in my lab for many, many years. And I will show you that indeed there is self-organization in us, the same way that there is self-organization in non-living systems and also self-organization in the little tadpoles that I showed you. I'm going to focus first on the first five days of our development, and then I'm going to shift a little bit more to the right. So let's start from this. What is it that we know? This is a video of a fertilized egg. This is how things start, and this is a time-lapse photography of early human development from a one-cell stage. And you will see that that cell divides in an asynchronous manner. Note that nothing is telling this cell to divide. There is no extrinsic influences coming from outside. All the information necessary and sufficient is contained within the DNA of this one cell. And somehow, this information is processed 
to generate many cells, hundreds of them, to make this little sphere that hatches out of the membrane. Sometimes we joke, we call this the first birth. People think that birth is when you come out of mom, but there is something else before that. It's when you come out of that little envelope. And then that sphere starts rolling in the wall of the uterus and at some point gets attached. I'm going to take you inside of that sphere so you can see inside of you. Only five days after fertilization. I have color coded. The code is down here, but it doesn't matter. This is technical information. Just remember that each cell of a different color is a different type of cells. And this is very early. We're only about 150 cells or so. So what do we see when we go in this? I'm going to rotate it for you. You can clearly see that there are different areas. There are different domains. There are cells that are smaller sitting at the bottom in green and red here. Cells a little bit bigger. You can see the limit by the purple color. I'm going to turn on and off channels here so you can see some of them, but not all of them. This allows us, me and my colleagues, to figure out where things come from. What is the origin of your brain? What is the origin of your heart? Where does blood come from? And each one of these cells will go ahead and process that information until it becomes highly specialized. The entire embryo is derived from this very small group of cells in red, yellow, and green. And the rest of the cells that are wired with the purple are going to give rise to what is called the extra embryonic tissue. This is things like placenta and umbilical cord and other structures that are associated to the embryo. Okay, so this is the place where I take you from the fertilized egg to about one week. Now I'm going to take you from one week to about two weeks later in our development. You notice already that there is a major change in shape. We're going from a sphere to something that looks a lot like a volcano. This structure is a cone with a crater that's broken in one side. And I'm going to take you inside of this in real human samples so you can appreciate what the architecture is like. DPF means day post-fertilization. So this is 10 days after fertilization. And you can already recognize that what was a sphere is now a disk. It flattens and it attaches. But the disk has different territories. I'm going to turn on and off channels so you can explore these territories. Uh, in the lab, we do this at will. In this presentation, because of time, I just choose a random distribution. But you can also see that in different territories, there are also holes. Not everything is made of cells. There is an appearance of some sort of a circuit, a network of tunnels that connect cells from one area of the embryo to the other area of the embryo. This is very amazing because the way we did this, and this is a key in my presentation, is just we provided an environment for the spherical embryo that I showed you to move forward again without any extrinsic influences. And so for the first time, we realized and unveiled this amazing self-organization ability that we have the same way as that frog egg had to make a tadpole. This is such a strong evolutionary wired concept that there is no animal or plant that I know in this planet that is not endowed with self-organization. If we go a little bit farther, two weeks after development, now I'm going to take you inside. You can already start feeling a volcano. I'm gonna, this is a space feeling model. We're going inside of the crater and we're looking around. And this is what you look like two weeks after fertilization. Every single one of us goes to that stage. Those of you who have 3D eyes and have the ability to distinguish in multiple dimensions will already recognize the uh, kind of relief and the, and the contours of the crater and at the bottom of the mountain. And again, turning off different lights and colors highlights different parts of it, and I will be very happy to discuss this in much more detail. It's very difficult to deliver that kind of information within five or ten minutes, as you can imagine. Okay. I'm going to show you one more example of self-organization, and then I'm going to end. And this is a concept called human embryonic stem cells. I hope most of you know what this is. If you don't, I will tell you. Um, human embryos, as I showed you in the sphere, are made of cells. You can isolate an individual cell from this embryo that I portray as this white circle. We know, or it's estimated, that the adults were made of about 220 different cell types. If you count the different cells, it's probably a little bit conservative, but let's take it for 220. 
Embryonic stem cells have this amazing ability, if I line up all the cells of our body with this different color circle, it has this ability to give rise to all the cell types of our body. So it's a very magical thing. The only other cell that we know in, in nature that does that is the fertilized egg. Of course, the fertilized egg can give rise to the whole animal, but at the given stage of development, a single cell of the human embryo can give rise to all the cell types, also can give rise to an entire organism. This experiment obviously has not been done with humans, but you can do this experiment with a mouse and clone a mouse, starting with a single cell of the embryo. Okay, so in the lab, in collaboration with the physics group, we decided to generate patterns that look a lot like human embryos. Remember that I told you that post-attachment were like a disc, a circle, a circle filled with different, with different cells. So we generated those in different sizes. The large ones are about 1,000 micron, one millimeter, a grain of salt, and the smallest one are about 80 micron. The different range of size, all in the same culture. I'm going to show you what happens if you just give a single stimulus to human cells at this, uh, in this stage. And I'm going to show you this in a dynamic movie we use genome editing technology. We go into the DNA and we mark different genes with different colors that the microscope can detect based on UV radiation and reflection at given frequencies, nanometers. And so what you're going to see is basically self-organization at the earliest stages of human development. I'm going to launch this movie and you are going to see something quite amazing. You will see that the cells at the edge are moving toward the center. That the red cells are coming from the edge, pushing the blue ones out, and ultimately the yellow cells emerge at the end. This is a radially symmetrical pattern. This is no different than the snowflake. It's exactly the same principle. To a large extent, you can consider the early development of a human being to be the same as the development of a snowflake. We are snowflakes. And just to finish this, just to tell you that I see it everywhere now, maybe I'm obsessed. If you look at a little bit later, a little bit more than three weeks, and again, this is what you look like. The circle highlights your head. The head is not closed yet. Your head is open at the time when it's being made. But something very interesting is going on there. What is going on is that the first neurons, the first nerve cells are being made, and the first circuitry is established. So we generate ultimately something that makes us human. Cognition, the ability to speak, to love, to dream, all those things that make us different than the other animals. All starts there. And if you look at the origin of that, and you say, well, where does this come from? Again, this is the formation of the brain in a petri dish of a human brain, and you can recognize, again, radially symmetrical structures. You can look at it with differential in interference contrast optic, DIC. You can look at it with genome editing techniques like CRISPR-Cas9. You can also look at the cell cycle by color coding cells that are dividing, which are in red, versus cells that are not dividing which are in green. So it's beyond the embryo. Even at the subset region of the embryo, for example, the brain that I showed you here, self-organization occur in our own development. And I could go on about heart, blood, muscle, bone, or cartilage, and you will see the same principle again and again. So I come back to my tadpole, and uh, always important to remember that our knowledge comes from we could have not understand ourselves if we didn't understand the tadpole. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm glad you came.